Hey, ballers! Starting off today, I have a bit of a selfish ask. We worked really hard to put out great and helpful content. So, if you enjoy the show, please rate us, review us, share us with a friend. This will help with our visibility and help spread the words to others who want to get into real estate or want to step up their real estate investing game. Now today, I'm having a chat with my friend Jerry Ta from Houston, Texas. Jerry is one of my oldest real estate friend, not by age, but one of the very first person I met in real estate. And Jerry is running a pretty sizable real estate property management company in Houston, Texas. So we talk about property management, time management, landlording, and eviction. So I think in the next forty-five minutes, you will find several aha moments. But first, let's get to the intro. Hey, ballers! Welcome to episode one twenty-four. With me is Jerry Ta from Houston, Texas. Hey, glad to have you here. How are you, Jerry? I'm doing well. How about yourself? Wonderful. It's a little gloomy today, so kind of make me、yeah. feel a little lazy. But otherwise, I'm doing great. So well, we're、uh, supposed to have our real estate social today, but we're canceling it because it's fifty percent chance of rain in the evening, and I don't I don't think anybody's going to show up if there's a chance of rain. What a bummer! Hey, why don't you give the audience a quick introduction, Jerry? Okay.、Uh, yeah, my name is Jerry Ta, and I, you know, I started in real estate back in 2011. I want to say I started in 2011 because that's when I bought my first rental.、Uh, since then, I bought a few rentals here and there. Started up a management company、uh, in 2013 called Property Care.、Um, we managed right around 400 units,、uh, but between, I guess, as a cumulative units, we've managed probably over a thousand、uh, at some point. You know, as a lot of people know. The market has been amazing to sell, so we've actually had a lot of investors that just really just made more sense for them to sell than actually keep the rental property.、Uh, between that, I'm a real estate broker, I'm a team lead for my、uh, own team, Carson Properties Group. So we do quite a bit of sales and also manage.、Uh, so we have two sides: our sales and property management side. And then I guess between that and how you and I met was、uh, in Homevestor. So we, we I had a Homevestor franchise. I feel like that's been a long time since I actually had it, but at, at one、has. point I had a home investors franchise.、Uh, I don't have it anymore. I think you still have your franchise, though, right? I am still in it. I have a couple、uh, of offices, and I'm actually a developmental agent with home investors now. So I've been moving、oh, okay. up in the world, Jerry. I didn't. I didn't know that. Maybe I needed your help at that time, but、uh, just just didn't feel like home investors were for me anymore. DA is the short for developmental agent, and、uh, I, I think we both had we had the same DA at the time, and I think、yeah. our DA was probably one of the best in the system. Yeah, that's how I met you, and obviously now you have been involved in many many aspects of real estate, right? You you do flip you flip a little bit, and you help building your 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 team, your agents team, your team of agents.、Mm-hmm. But your main business is the property management. Yeah, I mean, I like to consider everything I do part of my main business. You know, it's one of those things where if all of a sudden you don't consider something your main business, then that business tends to drop off to the point where it's not great anymore. So you always got to treat all your businesses、uh, like your kids or something with equitable focus. I guess you could say. Yeah. So you know, so as we, I feel like as we all grow up in real estate, we、mm-hmm. we started at with one thing, and then we start, you know, as we grow up, we add on different services or things that we do in real estate because it's a natural progression, right? Right. So as you do that, what does your operations look like today, and how do you divide what part of your time, or when do you focus on what? I actually so none of this stuff really came natural at all in terms of I, I guess trying to be manage one business and move on to the next one. But ultimately,、uh, you find functions in your business right that is repetitive, and then you offload that function to someone else. You know, I, we I have combination employees, virtual assistants,、uh, vendors, or you know, independent contractors that help me. I guess kind of move the business along. 
But yeah, I mean, ultimately you just find items that, you know, you can get someone to do on a repetitive basis and everything in your business needs to be systematized in some form or fashion to the best that you can. Uh, so everything that we can scale or systematize, I try to offload that function where someone can probably do it just as well as I can, as long as they put their full attention to it. I think you just said something really impactful is to delegate that the repetitive task to somebody else, right? Mm-hmm. Did you actually have to take the time to come up with a manual? How do you go about that? Because we can it's talk combination about of, it. <laughs> it's a combination. Uh, I, I used what's called Loom before. Thankfully that my virtual assistants and my employees, they've been with me for quite a while now. I think my longest tenure employee has been here for four or five years. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if I, I've had the same consistent employees, but I try not to use the term delegate. Uh, it's really not delegating. You're actually leveraging the people uh, that you're asking for help from. So leveraging, delegating means like, here's a task, figure it out. Uh, while leveraging, you're actually kind of getting in there and making sure that they understand what the goal is of what you're trying to ask them to do. Uh, so if there's any kind of surprises, they understand what they're doing, what's the end goal versus like, oh, I'm doing a spe- specific task and then something's off and they just have no idea what they're doing or they do it wrong. So you you want to leverage, you want to make them understand what is the goal of their task and what we're trying to achieve. And that way, if there's a slight you know difference or adjustment into the process that they'll understand that like we're still reaching the same goal versus like, oh, you know, throw their hands up and then reach out to you and ask you, oh, well, what's this now since it's a number has changed or something or the email that was received was received in a different form or something. Okay, so in your operations, uh, how mm-hmm. many employees do you have? So we have three employees plus two virtual assistants. Okay. Uh, do you use them across companies or do you actually have them dedicated to a company? We uh, have it separated. So we try not to go across. I, th- I think I think that's very important for a lot of people to do unless it's you know, some kind of assistant where you know they're overranging, but you do want to silo out your businesses where one set of group does this. So there's not, I think the communication kind of comes across wrong. So for example, somebody from one business might have a hard time communicating or asking something someone else from another business, and then it all kind of falls apart when there's no communication. But if you're all within one business, the communication tends to flow a little bit easier. Yeah, but I find that it's really tough for people like us who have multiple companies, right? And sometimes it may not make financial sense to hire one dedicated employee for each company or other time it's the same task just different company what's your take on that uh i mean that that really depends i don't and i'm not here to say that i don't actually use the same person for similar tasks i do uh but i try to minimize that unless it's for specific exceptions so it's not a constant but they do overlap in some senses so to, to answer your question there is some overlap but we do keep it separate for the most, like anything systematic, right? We keep it separate where there's really not interaction unless it's like something for a very specific transaction. Like for example, uh, like I said, so we do management, we do sales, right? Mm -hmm. So we have a listing and, you know, this house needs an item to be able to get sold after inspections. So I may use my maintenance coordinator, like, hey, can you reach out to our vendor and get this X, Y, Z done in order to sell the house? So that does happen, but on a regular basis, the answer is going to be no. Are you still involved in your day-to-day uh, operations in your property management company? And if so, at what capacity? I do on a high level. Uh, you know, I see all the emails and stuff come in. I, I don't think, you know, we're at the end of the day, we're, we're, we're tiny businesses, right? Uh, up until the point that I think at a certain level, then you may not, you may be able to not look at it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but no, I, I still look at everything uh, as far as the, the required tasks on a day-to-day basis, there are days that I, I won't have any tasks related to like my management business or the other business. So that's the goal that you're working towards? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a goal, you know, and you know, I, I learn and try to learn from a different, a lot of different people. But again, a lot of things, a lot of times it goes back to like culture. It's not, it's not about a manual, right? It's, it's kind of knowing what the company's trying to do, what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, you can't write a manual I mean, if he, you should know, right? In this business, there's not a manual for every little item that is done in this business. It's not possible. So you have to teach what is the goal? What are, what are we trying to reach? In, in very specific situations, 
what is the goal of it? Like if we have a maintenance issue on a house, everybody knows that the maintenance issue is not over until it's fixed, right? Mm-hmm. Not that when we send out a work order or contractors made out to the house. So, you know, if you, if you start sending tasks, like send the work order, the, the task is really not done right now. Mm-hmm. If you're delegating the task is like, Oh, it's done because I sent out the work order. Like, well, contractor actually didn't make it out or he didn't fix the problem. So we need a different contractor and you know, they could close out a work order just because of the fact that they send out a work order. That's really good. So let's, let's talk property management. So I mm-hmm. get asked this questions a lot, right? Should I hire right. a PM property man- management company? And my answer to that is I think when you small, you should hire a company until mm-hmm. when you grow to have so many rental that the cost of having the company may be equal to the cost of you hiring, bringing it in-house. Right. That's my kind of my take on it. What was yours? This episode is brought to you by Buzz Vacation Rentals, a premier property management company in Houston and Galveston areas. Buzz Vacation Rentals specializes in managing short-term rentals the right way. Give Buzz a call at 281-549-8432 to learn more or check out their website at listwoodbuzz.com. And that is listwoodbuzz.com. Now, back to the Real Estate Baller Show. So to answer this question, you kind of break it down to different scenarios, right? Mm-hmm. So if I were to ask someone, like, let's just say someone that owns a few rental properties, right? One yeah. or two, a couple, uh, even one. If I ask them, like, hey, do you think you can better, you can manage your property better than me, mm-hmm. right? Versus my company. Yeah. And, you know, their answer could be yes, right? And yeah. I wouldn't, it wouldn't, it, would, it actually wouldn't hurt my feelings, right? Right. And that's if, for example, if they put 100% focus, they're an intelligent person, they mm-hmm. put 100% focus in managing the rental properties. I don't think that's a problem. Like, I, I think they'd be probably very successful with managing the rental property. I think what happens, though, is that life gets in the way, right? Yeah. So all of a sudden, uh, you know, they're younger and all of a sudden they start a family, right? Now you have right. kids in the picture or you want to go on vacation and stuff. So and to my point, to my initial point was like, you know, once you systematize things, right? You scale it, you system, you systematize it out. Now, all of a sudden, if you're, something else comes up, your systems are failing, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So at that point, now I may ask a question like, do you think you're able to manage your property better than me? And the answer is probably no, because I actually have dedicated people to doing these functions on a day-to-day basis without fail. That's the goal, at least, right? Uh, while, you know, life gets in the way, you know, what a Sunday have a job that requires them to travel, right? Mm-hmm. There's so many things that can come along the way. And in that time span, you know, you kind of lose interest in managing your own rental properties. So, so I get asked the question all the time, like, hey, when should I get a property manager? I'm like, I mean, you could do it on yourself. I'm, I'm sure you would do very well with it. And, and that's just the truth. But if you want to kind of start and kind of build, if you want to buy more rentals, right? So I, I think you know this too, right? When you're, you have one property under contract, it's under remodeling, renovation. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden your attention is renovation, and then, but you still want to buy more properties. Yeah. So now your focus is split. But if you spend all your time on just renovating, you'll do great renovating. But if you spend all your time on selling, so it's all depending how much time you have, how much focus you want to give to each part of your business. And you're kind of going further as far as, oh, what if you own X amount of properties, 100 properties, for example? Uh-huh. Well, maybe at that time, it just makes sense to hire a person. Well, that's great. And I've seen that work well. But also, I've also seen that situation fall apart because the person that they've been training over the past five years has now decided to quit or Mm -hmm. they decided to move on with their life also. And you lose all that experience that you had training this one person. Uh, And the truth is, is that we want to say that we create manuals and stuff perfect all the time, but uh, there's nothing that beats experience. You know, someone can read a manual, Mm -hmm. but nothing beats the experience of managing hundreds of rental properties over five years. Well, I mean, at that point, when you have your in-house management, it's like another company of its own, right? Your mm-hmm. landlord and your property manager. Right. I mean, you know, does it at 30 rental properties, does that really make sense to hire a full time person or two or six? I mean, I, I, don't, I really don't know what at what number it would make sense. And, you know, you have to you want to hire quality people. Right. Too, right? So you got to pay them. In, and you probably know uh, wages have kind of gone up. So uh-huh. does, does it really make sense? Yeah. Do you guys have like a ratio of employee to properties? 
Yeah, so there's a, there's an industry standard. Uh, basically, you're always looking at one person per 100 properties. And then that number is kind of plus or minus depending on what kind of units that you actually take on. I think throughout the years that we've been a little bit more selective, I guess you mm-hmm. could say, with what properties we want to manage. We always say from the start that we're not slumlords. So we're not looking to be uh, slumlords, you know, properties. We want properties that manage that are in good shape, uh, owners that are willing to make the necessary repairs in order yeah. to keep them in good shape. So, you know, as you take on more properties that are in better condition or of higher quality, then that number could decrease because you're getting less, you know, attention required for per unit per property. That ratio is actually a lot higher than what we have in short-term rentals. We in the short-term rental industry standard, I believe, is one to fourteen. And you, you know, to, and to your point though, like you should never hire a long-term rental property manager to do your short-term rentals. Hey, you. Like, be, that was one of my questions I was going to ask you. You get in ahead of me here, since we're on this short-term rental subject. And mm-hmm. short-term rental obviously is getting a lot of tractions right now, right? It's just such a hot topic everywhere you go. And many long-term rental property managers think they can take it on. Mm-hmm. But you just, you know, voice your opinion on that's probably not a good idea. So tell us more. Uh, I mean, is what you just said, right? That in your standard, you almost need one person for every 14 properties. Short-term rentals, just how it sounds is that it's short-term. So the turnover on property is going to be a lot faster. So it's more intensive in terms of making sure that properties are put back into shape. You know, we have our maid service and stuff like that, mm-hmm. but that's not meant for short term. Uh, maybe we could do it. Not something that I want to test. Uh, I would really, you know, have my own set of employees that, you know, the the maintenance and stuff that's asked of is completely different for the most part. So yeah, not not something I'm interested in at this point, at least. Yeah, yeah. I mean, with long term, you have more time to do with maintenance. With short term, a lot of it is like you got, you know, eight hours, twenty four hours turnaround. Right. Very. Yeah, intense. and you're getting your brand new set of tenants like pretty constantly. Uh, that's not something we deal with either. Yeah, because they only there for a weekend, and you know, if the AC break down, it ruin a third of their trip. You know, half of their trip. Right. Let's get back to the long term uh, rental or just rental in general. What are some important things that an investor should know or consider when they are looking to buy a rental? I mean, before we get to that, I think another statistic that is commonly said is that if you have about eight rental properties and you're managing yourself, you've you've almost picked up another full-time job. So I, I want to believe that most people who buy rentals, like your goal was not to get a second job. So just just a reason, like I said, that's not a stat that I made up. Uh, it actually came from um, Tim Harridge, uh, which was always a whole investor guy. I always listen to him because he always has some good pointers, but he actually came with that stat. And, that, that's uh, a good yeah. point. That's a good point. Mm-hmm. You, you become, uh, you buy rental so that you can accumulate wealth, hopefully passively, right? Mm-hmm. And you don't want to have another job on top of your main job. Right. I don't think that's a goal when people initially buy rentals. I think people thought that was you know, more of a passive investment where, uh, you know, you get rent money and then there's not a lot that comes along with it. But that's really far from the truth. I guess you well, I don't know. Do we want to really go down this like, you know, a lot of people say, well, I can do the, the job. Why do I want to pay to hire a property management company? In my opinion, I think your time, their time is worth way more than what they would pay a property management company. And mm-hmm. if the investor buy at the right number, all the expenses should should have been factored in into their costs anyway. Right. When you say the right number, so this kind of go back to your initial question was that what do you look for in a rental property when you're buying? I, I don't, I do not get into what's a good deal or what's not a good deal Okay. at all. And the reason why I say that is because we deal with such a wide range of investors, right? Yeah. What's a good deal to you may be a terrible deal to someone else, mm-hmm. right? So it's all relative, right? Uh, a good deal to someone from California may be a terrible deal for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I don't really ever get into the numbers. Uh, people always ask me, you know, is this a good neighborhood? You know, and I give them my kind of high level, like, I think some of the standard stuff that I always look at at a house, right? So for example, freeway accessibility, right? is really important. Uh, I I always believe that houses for the most part 
like for example, closer to I-10 has a little bit more value in terms mm-hmm. of rental prices than homes like deeper, you know, between I-10 and 290. That takes a while to get into the neighborhood. I mean, especially, you know, up in 249 and 45 area, like if you're stuck, you know, 18 minutes, 20 minutes, you know, on Luetta or something, I don't, I, I find those homes less valuable in terms of rental prices than homes that are actually closer to like 45 or 249. Okay, I hear you loud and clear. You don't want to talk numbers, but you're talking <laughs> about closer to I-10. And mm-hmm. if we're talking about I-10 Houston, if you're closer to I-10, like west of downtown, the prices are high, the, right, right. the home prices. Well, so, I'm, I'm talking about in regards to a specific area, right? So okay. like if we're talking about like Bear Creek, Highway 6 area, I okay. believe Highway 6 area closer to I-10 is okay. more valuable than if you're stuck between I-10 and 290. If it takes a lot of time to get in. The other thing is schools. I mean, you know, you can never go wrong with schools. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, if you've been here long enough, I think there are certain school districts, certain schools that people really want to get in after. Mm-hmm. Uh, that generates, like, for example, I think Cinco Ranch, you know, generates a little bit higher rental value just because you're zoned to, for example, Cinco Ranch, a specific school in Cinco Ranch or, you know, Katy High School, for example. Mm-hmm. But, you know, even, uh, you know, in Maryland area, right? Like, if you're going, you know, for every block, you're losing like $100,000 in sales value. Like if you go from Chimney Rock to Hillcroft, you pass Hillcroft, you lost $100,000 in value. A lot of that is driven by, you know, the schools and the neighborhood that surrounds the schools. Yeah. Does HISD uh, lower the value? No. Uh, you know, that, that really depends on the kind of clientele neighborhood you're getting, right? Uh, so if you're saying HISD, I mean, that's so broad uh, <laughs> where you're talking about interloop HISD, right? So you're talking about townhomes or something. The bigger drivers in townhomes are... And sweet baths, right? So three, 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 three and a half. A three, three and a half has so much more value than like a three, two uh, for townhomes. Um, and the reason for that is because a lot of townhome renters are uh, roommates, and mm-hmm. they get roommates, and each person wants their own bathroom, you know, bedroom, and then bathroom within mm-hmm. the bedroom. And that has so much more value than like a three, two and a half. I'm going to change to something else, a a different topic maybe, or a different conversation. Where do you see this trend going with uh, rental? Is there a shortage right now? And, you know, where do you see it going? As far as the trend goes, I think we're trending towards what other large cities are, where if I were to guess, there's not many single family home rental properties in the cities of like New York or Los Angeles, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, A lot of renters... I believe I, I would I would imagine that the vast majority of the renters in those states or cities uh, live in apartments, uh, and I think the reason is because the homes are so expensive, where it doesn't make financial sense to turn a house into a rental. So I think we're headed towards that. Uh, and as I said, kind of mentioned earlier, was that I had a lot of investors, right, where it just didn't make sense for them to hold on a rental, where they're clearing, you know over $100,000. Uh, if they bought, if anybody bought a rental house back in 2012, 2013, you know, you cleared $100,000 probably easily at this point, you know, clear $100,000, you know, or earn that $200, $300 per month. You know, I think the 100000 just sounded so attractive to a lot of investors where I just had investors just kind of selling their uh, rental property. So I think due to the increase in value of homes, uh-huh. Uh, there's going to be less and less rental properties, single family rental properties available in Houston. And you can kind of see that trending also because there's always there's been quite a bit of apartments built in Houston. Yeah, I was interviewing a, a guest the other day and their model is actually more of mobile home. So they buy mm-hmm. mobile home and, and keep them for rental. And they notice a big change in uh, due to COVID that people were moving from apartments to mobile homes. I thought that was real interesting. Yeah, that, I don't. I don't know anything about mobile homes. I tried to buy one one time just because it was super cheap, and I did the simple math, and it was actually sold before I could get get to it. But that was the closest thing I ever had to a mobile home. I was trying to buy one. I'm gonna talk about the short term rental because that's something I'm passionate about. Uh, mm-hmm. Are you also noticing a trend of maybe losing property to short term rentals? We've had we've seen a few of those. I think. You know, there, we've had certain investors that kind of taken that dive over to the short-term rentals. Mm-hmm. I, th- I think the reason why less people have done it so far mm-hmm. is because people aren't aware that they don't they don't know if their property is actually attractive or not in order for short-term rentals, right? Like, for example, um, 
you know, like I have a townhouse in Midtown. Mm-hmm. If you ask me right now on a daily rate, how much I could rent out my townhouse for, I, mm-hmm. I couldn't, I don't, first off, I don't even, I wouldn't even know where to look, right? Like where would I run comps to know that? And, and the biggest difference I think between short-term rentals and long-term rentals is that, I mean, you guys got to use dynamics, uh, some kind of dynamic pricing, right? Yes. Uh, which requires a little bit more attention. Like for example, there's Super Bowl coming to town and I mean, you could be leaving thousands on the table if you're not adjusting your pricing to reflect, you know, a huge event coming in or not. That's right. But yeah, so I just don't think that I, maybe I, I believe that maybe more people would actually jump towards short-term rentals if they actually had a little bit more information about it or knew how their pricing work or what kind of their net profit or gross profit would be if they had those that information readily available. Yeah, I think one of the advantage that long-term rental has over short-term is that we can always pretty confidently come up with a monthly rent price value. Mm-hmm. You know, with short term, there's not enough data in Houston anyway to really right. come to a conclusive monthly rent average. And the hardest part for any owners to understand is some month you may get, you know, ten, fifteen thousand, 15,000 and some other month you may get one or 2,000. And that's right. a big pill to swallow. I mean, the other thing, as you know, there was an eviction moratorium. So I, I would imagine that there were certain owners that jumped towards, you know, short-term rentals just because of the eviction moratorium. I, th- I think the other thing is that, you know, the, the concept or idea of actually having to furnish the whole home uh, seems daunting, right? If you have three bedrooms and you want to lease out three bedrooms as a short-term rental, uh, having to furnish the home, clean the living room and stuff like that uh, seems like a significant expense. I, I, like I said, I don't want to have a clue. I've, I've never done it before. Well, so yes, as far as evictions go, I would agree with you on that because, you know, with short term, it's easier to to get someone out of the home than the whole process of evictions. And I know you've dealt with some of that in, uh, in your recent days. Mm-hmm. Maybe do you want to talk about that later? Yeah, I mean, I, I was, I, I, got, okay. you know, I, got, I got screwed personally uh, I, on my own rentals. So. But hold on, let me... Sorry, what's the other point? You got evictions and your uh, second point? It's furniture. Uh, furniture. Basically, you got to furnish a whole house in order to, um, and you want to make it presentable, right? Like you want to make it nice. I mean, if you want to earn a higher short-term rental rate, you want to make it look nice where people will pay that additional short-term rental rate. Yeah, and my suggestion for that is to amortize it into your cost, just as if you put in your down payment, you know. So when you do that, it helps. Every time you buy a property, you just offset your, put your, your furniture costs, amortize it over the year, and aim for that cash on cash return. But or, B, that's still, it's still cash out the door to, to it furnish is, it, though. It is. I mean. I, I'm not disputing it at all. <laughs> I, I'm not. And, and again, you know, whenever I help someone to evaluate, hey, do I do short term? Do I do long term? I always say, you know, let's let's look at all your costs. If the number makes sense, then maybe you do short term. If it doesn't, then maybe long term is the way to go. Yeah. You know, doing with a lot of investors, I, I think you probably know this too, but like when you buy an investment property, right? You run the numbers. Like you have X amount of renovation. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you're you exceed that renovation number. And then you start getting resistance from investors. Yeah. Now you take that number and then you gotta add furnishing costs on top of that it starts you know uh, i think you start just getting a lot of resistance from investors in regards to trying to furnish the whole place well which is not every property should be short term right right you've got to have the right property Mm -hmm. okay so sorry back to your point (laughs) oh eviction moratorium evictions yes let's let's talk about let's talk about eviction evictions happen happens to the best of us happens to me you know you would you would think that you know it's my own rental property right I screen the best i can but you know screening is at a point in time you know i get i get owners all the time that like what do you do to screen and like well and i've actually even read in sites that you know if you manage your own rental property that you'll screen better than the property manager and you know i'll tell you that that's bullshit because i screen probably thousands upon thousands of people so mm-hmm. number one Number one, I used to be an auditor, so I know what to look for. Yeah. And on top of that, I have the experience of screening people. Uh, we've had a lot of fake pay stubs come in recently. And I, I can spot them, right? There's okay. The numbers don't add up 
correctly, different difference in the font. Uh, so I spot them, right? And even beyond that, right? So owners are like, so how well do you screen? And I'm like, you know, honestly, I'm in it for the long game. So yeah. if you give me a property, if you think that all I care for is to earn that, you know, we co-broke almost 100% of our deal. So I earn half a month's rent to lease out a property, right? Mm-hmm. So if you think that I'm just looking for the leasing fee, like really couldn't care less, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm looking for you to buy this property. I'm going to put the best possible tenant in it. Mm-hmm. For you to buy your next one, and I'm gonna keep earning a management fee over the life that you own these rental properties. That's our goal. That's how. That's how I we totally build agree a with you on that. There, yeah. Yeah, like if you think that, oh, I'm gonna put in the worst possible tenant. We got to evict them two months later. I don't earn, so we don't have a vacancy fee, which is another thing, right? So yeah. just because, so now the tenant doesn't pay rent, yeah. we don't we don't earn a management fee. Uh, so our goal is not to put in a shitty tenant where he gets evicted and I earn a leasing fee, and then you're. I have a frustrated client that leaves me after their first property. That's that's not the goal at all. Mm-hmm. If I were to finish up my last thought on the eviction, right? Uh-huh. Eviction moratorium. And this is kind of the one thing that I kind of learned over time. You kind of evolve is that people are like, what you do? And I'm like, well, there's not a lot I could do, right? Like the government is literally saying that, you know, you can't evict someone. And if you try, you're going to get fined. Like it's the significant amount or even go to jail. So when, what was I supposed to do, right? So I just kind of, you know, it's just part of business, right? Uh, you know, I think, you know, back in the home investors days, like, you know, you just renovated a house and someone comes and steals your brand new AC condenser. Like, yeah, are you going to, are you going to stay mad that someone came and took your AC condenser or are you going to have to put a new one in there? Like life goes on, right. I guess my point. So I, you know, I looked around, I was like, what are my options? Oh, my options fucking is nothing. <laughs> so so what what am I gonna be mad about? What am I gonna sit him around and mope that you know I can't evict this tenant, he's not paying rent, it's not answering my phone calls, doing nothing, he's leaving my house for free. Yeah, it's I mean, does it suck? Absolutely, right? But what what am I what was I supposed to do? Like the answer is nothing. So, you know, you gotta let it expire. Uh, we actually try to evict them once their lease expired, uh, which yes. you were able to allow to evict after for expiration at least meaning getting your property versus not payment of rent you couldn't evict for not payment rent, but you could evict for someone like hey you gotta get in my house because our lease is now expired which is what we did in most situations okay. and did that uh, te- did that process go smoothly in texas the eviction filing process is really a paperwork process right mm-hmm. uh you gotta make sure you file correctly uh you got you have to have your you know your tenant ledger and everything your paperwork in line meaning you got to send a vacate notice and stuff and as long as you have all that support, theoretically, it should go smoothly. Now, that depends also on the judge, right? So it's turned out that, you know, interpretate laws being laws can be interpreted in different ways. Uh, and judges sometimes can take certain liberties in determining how they want to interpret a law. But for the most part, I would say judges here in Harris County uh, or, you know, Houston in general, they're, they're, they're pretty good about following what the law was meant to be. That's great. All right. So with everything that you got going on here, what's next for you? What's next? Um, So a a lot of things that kind of come up that we want to do is always actually solving our existing issues. You know, we actually use it. We normally use a service for eviction services. Yeah. And we're on our fourth eviction service. And it, it seems that none of these eviction services can file paper correctly, which really the biggest part of the job, right? Yeah. Uh, or file at the correct courthouse, which is our last problem because our eviction person filed at the in the incorrect courthouse and blame the courthouse for it. But if anybody ever filed eviction, they know that you have to make, you have to determine which courthouse. The courthouse would never tell you if this is the correct courthouse for your filing. Right. <laughs> and so kind of, I was like, uh, you know, I, I, and I'm not in the business of getting, you know, going back and forth like, I've done evictions in my life and done enough to know that the, the courthouse would never tell you which courthouse it is. Mm-hmm. So uh, we plan on starting eviction services soon. Is that here all, locally or is it for Texas or nationwide? Uh, just here locally for now, you know, just kind of, like I said, I just haven't found a good eviction service. I think, I think it's a potential business. I used to be an auditor, I used to be an accountant and filing paperwork, I think shouldn't be that hard. Uh, oh. Apparently it is for some eviction services. Well, do let us know when you have it, when you, you know, open. 
because I do agree that there's a huge need for it because I get asked all the time, well, who do you use for eviction services? And I used to use uh, nationwide evictions, but I think they changed to something else. And the process is totally different than what it was years ago. So. Yeah, I, so that, they were actually my first company. And I, I guinea pig myself, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I use them for my own property and they, they messed up. <laughs> they, they couldn't get that right. They couldn't put the landlord's name correct. And I was like, I don't know how that's possible, but all right. It's like getting screwed twice. <laughs> Yeah, I, <laughs> essentially. Uh, but right now, I think the only holdup as far as kind of getting things moving is uh, I don't know if anyone else trying to file, I guess, for entities. I can't seem to get a response on the entity. It doesn't seem like anyone is working at the Texas Controller's office right now. Oh, okay. All right. So wrapping up, what is the one thing that people might be surprised to learn about you? I don't know. I, that I'm just full of surprises, you could say. <laughs> I love your answer, uh, Jerry. <laughs> yeah, I, I really have no idea what people think. I like to think I'm interesting, but you know, you know, people have different opinions. I guess you could say. It depends on who you ask, huh? Yeah, pretty much too. <laughs> okay, so how does the audience get in touch with you? Uh, probably our website. You know, website has our phone number. It's propertycarehouston.com. Best way to reach out if you're looking to have a property manager. Just submit that information sheet with your address and. Uh, we can, we can have a talk about it. Thank you for watching the Real Estate Baller Show. And thank you, Jerry, for joining me today. If you find value in this show, give us some love. Give us a like and subscribe to us. Also, please help us spread the word by sharing this episode with a friend or give us a shout out on social media using the hashtag REBallers. Lastly, leave us a comment below. Let us know what you learn, what you use, how the show impact you or if there's something that you want us to discuss about it also helped with the rating so thank you so much and see you next time